clean water, and 842 million people are undernourished. 1.3 billion people have no access to electricity, and 2.6 billion people are without sanitary cooking facilities. Secure access to clean and safe energy, water and food are essential building blocks for reducing extreme poverty and for building a healthy future. It is a healthy and fertile environment that can provide long-term economic security for many of the poorest people. Yet the environment is often destroyed for short-term economic gain. The provision of energy through dirty sources and deforestation and land clearing for food has immense adverse effects on the environment, creating smog, health problems, carbon pollution, degraded land and greenhouse gases. The effects of climate change, such as more frequent intense storms or dry spells, have the greatest economic impact on those with the least resilience. We need cleaner and greener ways of tackling extreme poverty, with smarter ways of building in resilience as climatic variability costs increase. The biggest challenge is seeing the big, interlinked picture. Professionals from health, finance, climate, education, economics, energy, food and crop science and urban planning need to work together on a truly integrated development agenda for 2015. We can't eliminate the extreme poverty if the wider environmental conditions worsen and push people back into poverty. We can't spend money and effort on climate change solutions if the poorest of the world are not also help to become more resilient. Putting in place strong and fair approaches to tackle climate change and extreme poverty together will improve the lives of billions of people. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Hussein. I'm a BBC journalist, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this next, se next session, uh, which is really focused on two very pressing challenges that the world faces today, uh, tackling extreme poverty through the next stage of the Millennium Development Goals and also making progress, long-awaited progress, on an international framework for climate change. Sometimes these goals compete. Often, people are seen more in one camp than the other. But of course, there is so much evidence now about how these goals uh, can and should be tackled together. Progress on development can easily be eroded by extreme weather and climate disruption, and the environment often pays the price for short-term economic gain. So um, the question will be how uh, we can consider these two goals through uh, the same prism as we move forward with the development agenda. So I'm delighted to welcome to our panel the UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the President of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, the Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Solberg, the Finance Minister of Nigeria, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, the former US Vice President and Nobel Laureate, Al Gore, uh, Bill Gates of the Gates Foundation, and the CEO of Unilever, Paul Polman. So some very different perspectives um, from within the panel. I'd like to begin, if I may, by asking the Secretary General to outline how he would like to see this debate move forward. And with the global economy and better health, Secretary General, I'm assuming that you would want the focus to return to some of the things that, that might have been bypassed in the last few years. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, discuss with you, uh, listen to your concerns, and explain my uh, vision on climate change. Climate change has been on the top of our global agenda many years. Uh, but without much satisfactory uh, progress uh, because of all uh, differences of uh, national interest uh, with uh, some lack of uh, global uh, vision. Uh, it's true that uh, all science has been telling us this climate change has been putting all of us, us and our planet Earth at risk, our communities, and our businesses, small or large, and even our national security, political 
instability has been caused by the impact of climate change, then we have to tackle this uh, climate change. There is uh, some uh, misperception that tackling climate change shouldn't it, uh, wouldn't it uh, affect uh, or reduce our capacity to address uh, global growth, uh, millennium development goals, our future developments. I think this is wrong uh, perception. Tackling climate change will put all of us onto a sustainable de development growth. And the t addressing all of our life and our business activities on sustainable way will help us in tackling climate change. Therefore, these two issues are mutually reinforcing, mutually uh, supporting. Tackling climate change will, first of all, enable us to have uh, universal access to energy. It will have uh, even strengthen our capacity to resilient uh, infrastructure. It will also help our global health, sustainable, sustainable uh, urban and transportation, uh, biodiversities, and it will also uh, help us to address uh, climate change, uh, short-lived the pollutants, all these are very important uh, ones which we have uh, invested on to uh, this one. Uh, that is why uh, I'm going to convene Climate Change Summit meeting at the United Nations on September 23rd. This will be only dedicated on climate change. I'm inviting all government leaders, business leaders, and civil society leaders, and even philanthropic community leaders, so that they can bring their own commitment. There are two purposes. First, raise political awareness and political will at the highest possible, because we do not have any time lose at this time. We have only two years. Bring, please bring your ambitious target and commitment to tackle this climate change. And second one is to catalyze ambitious and decisive actions on the ground on all the challenges which we are now facing in our planet Earth. For that, I have some clear messages to first the political leaders and business community leaders and civil society leaders. Because in addressing this climate change, sustainable development, we need to have a very strong, tight partnership among government, business communities, and civil societies. To business political leaders, please come to the United Nations Summit meeting on climate change with a very decisive and determined and passionate and visionary leadership for the future of our generation and for the future of a sustainable planet Earth. Instruct your negotiators with a firm and decisive visionary leadership. Then for business community leaders, I have four messages to tell you. First, increase your investment, bankers, Service pro finance service providers. Increase your finance flows to uh, sustainable growth, sustainable growth. Now, low carbon energy, climate resilient infrastructures, and deployment, including deployment of climate bond. Then decrease your investment in carbon intensive and obsolete technology, and business as usual, business patterns. Uh, thirdly, enhance your transparency uh, with regard to uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the assets or from the companies you have invested or you are financing. Then fourthly, work together with the government and civil society 
and align your business practices to sustainable path. The last three civil society leaders, you are not in the government, you are not in the business, but you represent the moral voice of the people on the ground. Raise your voice. If your government's policies is not in line with sustainable business practices, then raise your voice and challenge your president, prime ministers, <laughs> senators, and congressmen, and business leaders. If uh, business practices are business as usual, uh, just uh, not in line with the sustainable development, not helpful in tackling climate change, again, raise your voice, and the United Nations will hear your concerns and aspirations. And that is the main purpose of having summit meeting on climate change this September. And, and, and from there, we will go to Peru and the next year in Paris to have a global legal climate yeah. agreement. So, so, so you in, hope that yeah, that meeting in, in September then pushes the negotiations Thank forward. You very much. Uh, Dr. Kim, I wonder if I could ask you, I mean, as the World Bank, you are involved in development programs and development plans right around the world. How many of those um, are written or viewed through a climate lens? Well, we're, we're trying to look at everything we do um, from a climate lens, but let me, let me just take a step back and look at the way that you have uh, posed the question. There's development, and in, in my case, I've worked on uh, health and education and development for most of my adult life, and then sometimes people juxtapose that with, uh, with the environment. So let me just step back and say, you know, um, uh, there's not yet in my head a grand convergence of all these different problems, but there's been tremendous lessons that I think we as a global community have learned, and I certainly have learned personally. And if you look at some of the greatest social movements in history that accomplished their goal, uh, uh, one related to uh, the child survival movement around vaccines, another related to the unbelievable movement to try to find uh, both vaccines and treatment for HIV that have led to now 10 million people being treated, tremendous work, much of it um, uh, supported by, uh, by Bill Gates, on understanding the nature of, a, of, a, of a, the potential of a vaccine in HIV, that in all of those, what happened was there was a plan and there were very specific targets with very specific end dates. And I, so I think, you know, the, the, the thing that, um, that we're trying to do now at the World Bank is to look at all of our projects and say, are there things that we know to be good, good for the environment, good for people? Uh, for example, are there ways of uh, reorganizing the way we do agriculture so that we both increase yields, put more carbon back into the ground, and have an impact uh, both on the climate and on people's ability to feed themselves. The good news is that there's a lot of programs like that, but they're mostly in the pilot project phase. And uh, innovations in one place are not spread to other places, and we're not scaling the things that we know are good. So if I were to look at these two, I, I would say this. First of all, we have to make sure that we don't pull uh, defeat out of the jaws of victory by losing sight of things like the MDGs. You know, one of the things that the Secretary General and I are doing, and we instituted for the first time, is every six months, all the heads of the UN agencies, along with myself and the IMF, are meeting to, to, try, to, to try to accelerate progress along the MDGs, because those were good goals. And they remain good goals, and they will remain, continue to remain good goals. And for climate, I think we have to step back and say, what are the things that we know to be good that we can do right now? You know, uh, uh, building more, uh, more cleaner, more livable cities, uh, in New York City, they set a target of reducing their carbon intensity by 30% by 2030. They're going to get there by 2017, and the economy is growing. They found ways of growing the economy while at the same time reducing carbon footprint. So I would say at the end of the day that while there might, may not be some easy, grand sort of bringing together of these issues, there are so many things that we know we can do right now, and I would, I would say we need to set some targets for September even for Secretary General's summit. Why, can't, why wouldn't we be able to in, increase, for example, uh, green bonds from t the $10 billion current level to $20 billion? That's a perfectly reasonable goal to set, uh, that, something that's, that's very positive and very good. Why don't we set uh, a gigaton target for how much carbon as a, as a, as a world we can take out of the air yeah. over the next few years? So, Certainly there are lessons to be learned, and both agendas, I think, are, are, are critically important. Okay. Um, Al Gore, as someone who's been known for a long time as a climate activist, evangelist, this must be music to your ears, seeing development through a climate lens. 
Well, I think we're getting uh, closer to a tipping point, a political tipping point. We're not there yet, uh, but I want to thank Klaus Schwab and his team uh, here at the World Economic Forum for elevating the world's uh, discussion of this issue uh, and setting the stage f for real action with the Secretary General's meeting in September and Dr. Kim's work. I think there is a, a convergence and a linkage. Uh, I think that the wonderful work that Bill and Melinda Gates are doing, for example, um, illustrates how crucial it is uh, to, b because depressing the rate of child mortality, educating girls, empowering women, and making fertility management ubiquitously available so women can choose how many children and the spacing of children uh, is crucial to the future shape of human civilization. Africa is projected to have more people than China or India by mid-century, more than China and India combined by the end of the century. And this is one of the causal factors uh, that must be addressed. Now, where climate itself is concerned, uh, there is convergence there as well. Uh, these events uh, that come out of uh, climate-related extreme weather uh, really hurt uh, the fight against poverty and the fight to improve health. This morning, today, there are four million refugees who are homeless in the Philippines. And when Super Typhoon Haiyan formed in the windward areas of the Pacific, before it, uh, impacting the Philippines, the Pacific Ocean was 3.4 degrees Celsius hotter than normal. Two years ago, uh, just uh, before Hurricane Sandy hit New York and New Jersey, the windward areas of the Atlantic were five degrees Celsius warmer than normal. I think that these extreme weather events, which are now a uh, hundred times more common than 30 years ago, are really waking people's awareness uh, all over the world. And I think that is a game changer. And it comes about, of course, because we continue to put 90 million tons of global warming pollution into the atmosphere every day as if it's an open sewer. Uh, and the accumulated man-made global warming pollution there now, according to calculations by NASA scientists, trap enough extra heat energy in the Earth's system every day, uh, that equivalent to what would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every day. That's why the oceans are warmer. That's why the water, the air is warmer. That's why the droughts are deeper. The floods are bigger. The ice is melting. But there's a second game changer, and that is uh, that the cost down curve for photovoltaic electric energy, and to a lesser extent wind, is now so impressive that in 13 countries, the price of electricity from solar is equal to or cheaper than the grid average price. Uh, and the projections are that over the next decade and perhaps sooner, the vast majority of the people in the world will live in regions where that is true. It's not as uh, steep a cost down curve as Moore's Law and computer chips, but it's very impressive and it is opening up great opportunities uh, for the world to really solve the climate crisis. Um, Bill Gates, I wonder how you view this um, new emphasis on um, climate and development. Do you have any concerns that, that if we place the emphasis more firmly in that direction, that it may then reduce the focus in some of the areas where your foundation has made a lot of progress, particularly on global health? Well, the, uh, the first thing I'd say is that the development agenda is actually going well. And there's a bias because headlines are about bad news and setbacks and people want to raise more money, want to remind us on what's yet to be done, like a billion people still in extreme poverty. But when you really look at it, it's a very positive story. Uh, whether you look at it from an economic point of view, uh, extreme poverty cut from 35% to 15%. Uh, if you look at it on a country view, the number of countries who've moved up to middle income, uh, now most people living in middle income countries, which as you move up there, you become at some point self-sustaining and you don't need aid, so we can focus aid on the, the countries that remain. So we're doing a very good job on uh, the economics. Uh, we need to take the next 30 years and stay focused on that. Uh, so I think as we renew the MDGs, the idea of extreme poverty and uh, child to death being there on the very first page as, as global priorities, 
I think that's uh, quite important. The people who give aid, uh, like Norway, who's extremely generous, uh, we're all getting smarter about how we use that. And there's been a shift to health and agriculture as particularly catalytic. There's been a shift to more measurement of these activities, and I, I think that's good news that hasn't gotten out. And as Al Gore said, if you get health improved, if you get availability of contraceptions, then families will voluntarily decide to have less children. And that's good for all of this. If you want to feed, educate, preserve the environment, getting the peak population to be closer to nine than 10 billion, uh, that's good news. So I don't think it's necessary that focusing on climate change should take away from the development agenda. Climate change is a very important issue, and in fact, it should make us invest more in helping poor farmers because weather's always been a problem for them, weather's increasingly a problem for them. It wasn't good to begin with, but uh, the trends are not, not in their favor. And as they get better seeds, storage, then they can handle a year uh, that's bad without malnutrition or in the extreme case, starvation. So the good news on the development agenda is there. I think one thing that both agendas need is uh, research and development focused on helping them achieve their goals. Uh, so in health, that would be an HIV vaccine, a malaria vaccine. Uh, in energy, um, despite the progress, reliable energy requires storage, uh, requires getting the economics to be even better. And it's disappointing that the R&D budgets, whether in the energy space or the health space, haven't been a priority, and the economic crisis has made it easier not to think of those investments, because they only pay off in the 10 to 20 year time frame, particularly if you add in the, the deployment complexities for both energy and, and, and health. Um, so I, you know, I think both things are very important. I think uh, climate's uh, got an awareness problem. And one, one issue I think we have to be careful of is that as the poorest are being lifted up, as they're getting uh, lights and refrigerators. We are going to use more energy. There's not a solution here where we use less energy. We have to make the energy we use uh, not, not emit any greenhouse gases, particularly uh, CO2. So development's going well. Climate, I hope uh, people are right that we can get uh, the same sort of understanding of the solutions there that we now have in the development space. Well, I'd like to turn now to the perspective from a country that sees the sharp end of all of this and turn to the finance minister of Nigeria. Um, how much um, are both of these challenges that your government are trying to deal with? Well, thank, thank you, Michelle. Um, actually, um, we find the debate a bit um, artificial in the sense that the way we experience these two ph phenomena, if you want to put it that way on the ground, is completely as one thing. Uh, there's really no separation between the environmental impact and the development of poverty-related impact. I'll just give you a clear example. Uh, in 2012, we experienced unprecedented floods uh, in Nigeria and Benin on the West African uh, coast in those two countries that we hadn't had in 35 years. And a million households were affected in my country and, um, you know, it set us back tremendously in terms of the poverty agenda. Livelihoods of farmers were wiped out. Investments we made in health and health clinics and all that were wiped out. So there's no separation. And to us, if we do not get a grip, a grip now on solutions uh, to deal with uh, climate change and start greening the way we look at everything we do, uh, I think this will cause a problem. We also need to uh, move away I think since we're experiencing this now, we really need to move to solutions. And I just want to say that in Africa, we are not waiting. We have come up with a solution of our own called the African Risk Capacity. We've turned to private sector to look at what they're doing. And we've set up a weather-based insurance mechanism. We're trying to capitalize it with $150 million. Countries will buy insurance. And when there's an event, instead of waiting several months for an appeal for humanitarian aid, in this will kick in 
the insurance payments will kick in within three weeks. I think we really need to focus on supporting these kinds of approaches that countries and continents are coming up with themselves to try to address both the problem of development and its uh, linkage, uh, the strong interrelationship with climate change. I don't think we're focusing enough on that and we want action now. Yeah. Well, Let's talk then about the solutions and get the business perspective because Paul Polman from um, Unilever, you know, a, country, a, a company with a huge global presence. Um, the Secretary General's also called upon business to play its part. What would playing its part or what does playing its part look like to you? Well, the Secretary General was very courageous. I've said it many times when he uh, created the uh, high level panel to look at the uh, post 2015 goals. He actually included uh, some people, uh, Betty Maya from Kenya, and myself from the business community, which obviously wasn't an easy decision and, and we had to earn our respect on the panel there. But what was very clear is what Negoshi says, these issues are very uh, uh, integrally linked. Uh, first of all, let's go back to what this is all about. It's, it's first and foremost, as uh, Bill mentioned, is poverty alleviation. But when we reached out as part of this uh, year and a half effort on the panel, it became also very clear uh, with feedback, by the way, from business community that is about 10% of the global economy, so an enormous response, that we have to do this in a sustainable and equitable way. And uh, these are integrally linked, and we should stop talking it as a problem, but seeing it more and more as an opportunity, uh, which obviously would get much more attention of the business community. So when we um, uh, talk to the uh, broader uh, business community out there, I think you see more and more business dealing with costs of climate change coming into their business model. We're getting to a point that costs of some of the things that El was mentioning about the Philippines or other things exceed uh, the cost of not having an investment are higher than the cost of doing the investment. So it becomes an attractive opportunity in many of these areas and that is what obviously is very attractive for the business community. You take the area of food security that Bill alluded to. Uh, the billion people, more or less, that go to bed hungry every day, not knowing that they wake up the next day. Yet we are wasting 750 billion of food in the supply chain. 30 to 40 percent of the food is wasted. That's an immense business opportunity. Forget about the fact that it's climate change, because all that food needs to be produced, the water, the climate. So there's a climate change dimension to it. So business understands the cost and wants to take more and more action. Business also, unfortunately, in the current economic or political climate, looks a little bit more long term than the average politician. And business is seeing what is happening with population growth, with running out of scarce resources, uh, with the projections of climate change, if that is not reversed. And business is actually more concerned than some of the uh, political environment. And then the last thing I mentioned is the opportunities. So when we, um, what we now see happening is here at the Forum and other things, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Global Consumer Goods Forum, we see <coughs> enormous activities happening uh, of multi-party partnerships, often not only with the business community, but also with governments or with uh, civil society, um, to attack these issues and to turn them into an opportunity. The Secretary General and myself this morning uh, just came from the new vision for agriculture, something that started here four years ago. It is now in 17 countries, 5 billion is being pledged. The Nutrition for Growth added another 19 billion to that. It deals directly with alleviating poverty focused on smallhold farmers, but under the zero hunger challenge in a sustainable way. Why not design it the right way? We've created the Tropical Forest Alliance as an industry. Consumers don't want to buy anything anymore that comes from illegal deforestation. We won't be able to sell our products. Assuming the they know it's come from illegal deforestation. They are increasingly they knowing know. because they're connected and talking to each other. They know what happens in a factory in Bangladesh. They also know, or they certainly want to know, if it's beef or horse meat. They also want to know if it is sustainably sourced or non-sustainably sourced. It's happening as we talk. Just stopping the issue of illegal deforestation is 17% of global warming. Why not solve that in a way that this also takes care of smallhold farmers, takes the climate change away 17%? So business likes these tangible projects. We have a unique opportunity now with the SDGs and the climate change negotiations coming together. The summit that the Secretary General has asked for in September to rally the business community, to share these projects for scaling, and to say also to our political co uh, community, it's possible. It's not a trade-off. We can do both, and we can do, do both successfully. For once in our lifetimes, and probably the only our lifetimes, not even our predecessors or the ones that come after us, for once we have an opportunity, all of us here in the audience, all of us here at the podium, in the next 15 years, 
to eradicate poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way. Don't we want to be part of that? And I can tell you, I haven't met a business person who doesn't want to be part of that either. Paul Pullman, thank you. Let me turn now to the Norwegian Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, a new Prime Minister. It's your, your first time at Davos. Um, your predecessors in the government um, made leadership on climate change really a cornerstone of what they're doing. Yours is a centre-right coalition government, and I, and I wonder whether the same leadership will be provided by Norway as has done in the past. It will, and it's, um, as the Norwegian... <coughs> The Norwegian Parliament in 2007 and again in 2012 uh, had a large uh, um, agreement on um, the work against uh, climate change. It has a very strong um, and firm basis between most all of the political parties and the new government is ruling on that agreement and we are even saying that we are going to strengthen it with new measurements and uh, of course fulfilling the, um, the um, goals that we have both internationally and nationally. But if I may say something about the interlinking between uh, poverty eradication and, and, um, and climate change, I think we all can agree that these are interlinked. We will not reach the M MDGs uh, if we have large climate catastrophes in the years to come, because we know conflicts and catastrophes are turning backwards all, all the, the, the measures that we are reaching on the MDGs. On the other hand, we also know that growth has up until now been quite interlinked with more emissions. So what we really do have to do is to decouple uh, the uh, economic growth with the emissions of greenhouse gas gases. That means that we have to have an agenda that is both about greenhouse gas emissions and about development at the same time. And that means that we, because I don't think any of us who sit in the well-being part of the world can say that um, the rest of the world will not need new energy, because they will. If, the, if we are going to reach the MDGs, if we are going to increase them after 2015, then we will, in, of course, also need more energy. And then we need mechanisms to make sure that that is more renewable, that it's uh, climate sustainable, and, it's, um, and that we have to look for that type of mechanisms as part of the new agenda. And yet, on this very note, this week, the European Union, which has been one of the leaders of action in climate, is rolling back on binding targets for nation states on renewable energy. Al Gore? Well, I don't think that's fair. Uh, yes, they r rolled back the mandated targets for renewables, but they actually moved aggressively forward in adopting a binding target for a 40% reduction in carbon emissions. And actually, uh, the renewable energy projects have now, technologies have now begun to mature to the point where they can be a part of the mix. I still think there should be targets in my country, for example, but the EU has actually taken a step forward, in my opinion. So you weren't disappointed to, to see the announcement this week on, on, on the removal of, of those binding targets? I, I think that we have to wait and see how the enforcement mechanism is arrived at and designed, because the 40% reduction will be allocated among the countries. There are large fines proposed for those countries that do not meet their allocated portion of the reduction target. And how that works, uh, it, we will have to see. But I am actually in, encouraged uh, by what the EU has done. And I think they've gotten a little bit of, a, of an unfair uh, criticism on what they've just done. Secretary General, you know, even in us starting to talk about the issues in climate, um, I'm reminded of, you know, each time we have these big gatherings, and you've referred to the one upcoming in, in Peru and then later on in Paris, there is, these are normally events um, which end with a huge amount of disappointment. I mean, what is it that makes you think that your climate summit and the talks in the future are going to be any different? Uh, before I answer that, I would, I would like to... Uh, <clears throat> agree to what uh, Vice President Al Gore just said. Yesterday, I said that, that this is a very positive one, uh, that EU has started ball rolling. This is exactly what, as a Secretary General of the United Nations, before we convene summit meeting, that the leaders 
would come out with the bold uh, measures and commitment, ambitious target, whether there is uh, some uh, level of uh, satisfaction or not, I think it is a very positive one. We have to support. As uh, Al Gore just said, that they are going to meet uh, in March for a uh, summit meeting. I strongly <coughs> recommend it and urge European leaders to make it a binding agreement, internationally binding agreement, which should be emulated by many countries in the world. Then the leaders' commitment should be substantial, scalable, measurable, and also replicable. This is my message. And we will work very closely with the European Union and others. There are some encouraging countries, like China is also very much committed. Still, you know, they have to cut greenhouse gas emissions a lot, but the leadership has a very strong, determined will, and even the uh, United States, uh, President Obama is uh, very much determined to, uh, <clears throat> to lead this one, even though he may have some uh, congressional uh, relationship uh, difficulty with the Congress, but I sincerely hope that all these uh, major countries lead this campaign. Now, about uh, my summit meeting, uh, there are some, you know, <clears throat> saying that uh, what kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, agreement or achievement will you have? Uh, this is not going to be a negotiation the forum. Negotiation will have to be done by at the uh, United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, what is known as UNFCCC. But my message to the leaders is that. This time, you must be very, very serious. We don't have time to lose. So direct, give direction to your negotiators. Look beyond your national boundaries. Climate change does not respect the national border. It impacts whole global world. That's my message. This will be a solutions-based summit. This will be action-oriented summit. This is my strong commitment. Then we will go to Peru. I expect that the negotiators will make a solid document, draft a document, so that from next year, that we will be able to really negotiate. And then by the time it comes to Paris 2015, this is a promise agreement among the member states of the United Nations. They agreed that let us agree a agreement on this climate change. That is their agreement, so they must keep this uh, target by 2015. Thank you. Well, let's just talk about the Millennium Development Goals for a moment and, and about the, the set of goals that will eventually replace them. Um, Bill Gates, I wonder what you would really want to see. I mean, you, you already said that you'd want to see extreme poverty and childhood death on the first page, but how ambitious should those next steps next set of targets be? Or, or is, imp is it important that they are achievable in, in order that some kind of momentum remains? Well, the uh, first MDGs did a fantastic job. Uh, they actually set targets for the world that were so ambitious that we didn't achieve all of them. The poverty goal, number one, we achieved. People point out that China's a big part of that, but uh, the rest of the world also made progress. Uh, childhood death, uh, the goal was two-thirds. We cut it by half. Uh, going forward, our analysis, looking at getting vaccine distribution better, new vaccines that will come along, we think we can do another uh, two-thirds uh, reduction goal. Uh, and for maternal mortality, uh, it, it, we ought to be able to cut that at least in half. So the experts have been talking about ambitious goals. And so if the original eight goals emerge as still big priorities, uh, the updating of those, I think, will be very straightforward. Prime Minister? I think, I think one of the really good, um, the reasons why we get these good results is that they were, they were measurable, they were concrete, uh, and I think it's very important that the post-2015 is the same, that it doesn't come into... Uh, political words. It's measurable, it's target that you can meet, uh, and, but they have to be ambitious at the same time. And 
Personally, I believe also that there is a gender part of this because one of the areas that we have not reached the Millennium Goals on are some of the gender um, goals that we had. That's why I think one of the priorities that we should work on still is girls and education because education is part of what really makes gender equality easier and we know it's a large investment in health when you invest in girls' education. But I think the, the most important thing is that we don't end up with political goals that are good to make speeches on, but not very easy to measure if uh, the politicians and the national leaders who have who made the decisions, in fact, can follow through. Yeah, Minister. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I just wanted to come in here and say that um, one of the reasons why uh, we sometimes encounter these difficulties in the summits that you talked about, and uh, we don't move forward as fast, is because uh, we haven't yet come to grips or so agreed on how these, uh, meeting these goals are going to be financed. I think that issues always founder, uh, particularly for de developing countries, whether it's on the eradication of poverty agenda the, the, uh, or the environmental, integrating the environmental aspects, the issue of uh, financing is a very important one, and it often breaks down when we can't come to agreement on that. So I think we really need to think, as we move towards the post-2015, and you know, I want to thank the Secretary General for the uh, panel that we were privileged to work on with Paul and others, and what we achieved. The financing and the enabling is key. If we can't come to grips with that, both for the environmental side, the development side, or the SDGs seen together, we will found. I think we need to think very creatively. Uh, work has shown, both by the World Bank, uh, the International Energy uh, Agency, and others, uh, that you know, fuel, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, I think the latest figure is about $544 billion now. Uh, you know that if we phase this out, we could release resources that would go towards financing some of these goals that we are talking about. We need to think creatively of the countries themselves, how they can better mobilize their own domestic resources. And I think in many of the African countries, we have finance ministers, we are actively ourselves meeting and thinking of how can we do better in terms of our own t domestic resource mobilization, improving our tax system, financing ourselves. So not ourselves. just about international donors and calling no, for it's not all about donors now. Most of us, uh, you know, we are now on a different path. Yeah. That's the path of looking at investment. That's the path of the private sector and what we can do with private sector solutions. That's the path of looking at ourselves and what we can do. And there's very little investment, really, in trying to support these systems of domestic resource mobilizations, better tax administration, but also getting the world to phase out of wealth fossil fuel. We tried it in Nigeria. It was a very costly political move, and my president was very brave to stick with it, and to, we phased out 50% of the uh, oil subsidies we have. Yeah. I, I think I, we should all be brave to I'd try like to and do I'd like to come to Paul something. Pullman in a second, but Dr. Kim, I mean, that, that's a call to action for you, if, if not to be doing the financing, uh, but to identify those mechanisms to help the countries unleash some of those resources that the minister's but, been you know, talking the, about. The, the fossil fuel subsidies is a great example, and it's so politically difficult. And so one of the things that uh, we're, we're working on is to be able to provide um, social protection for the poorest so that uh, the removal of fossil fuels has a relatively uh, lower impact. And sometimes that has made it easier to remove those subsidies. But we've really talked about it in the area of climate change Five very concrete things that we can do right now. You know, um, we don't want to get into the situation that we got into in Copenhagen, where everyone was waiting for the political agreement, thinking that that's when they were going to take action. So we're, we, we've been focusing on um, uh, things that, that we think are very practical that we can do right now. The, the phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies is so difficult politically, but we're making um, uh, support for the poorest available to any country that wants to start down that process. I think, but it could never amount to the same amount as the subsidy, can it? I mean, the, the help that you offer. Yeah, you, you know, uh, we think that there are good examples of providing enough social support for the poorest so that they are not impacted by the removal of fuel subsidies. And, and the point is you've got to find a way to do that in order to make it politically feasible. And, and there are some good examples of when that's happened. Again, it's so difficult because most people are thinking in terms of short-term political cycles. But the other things, like um, uh, Bill mentioned about agriculture, protecting smallholder farmers, there are things that we can do right now in agriculture, in, in urbanization, and in making financing available for renewable energy 
We can do that right now. And my own view is that if we get aggressive in setting some targets, setting some goals, that can actually help the political process uh, 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 be more effective. So I, you know, I just want to repeat, we need to set some goals for what we're going to be um, uh, pledging in September, something that we can all bring to the table in September and hope that our concrete action will um, we'll spur along the political yeah. process. Um, Paul Polman, you were talking about business investing to guard against climate change, but how do you, how do you the advantage of a national framework is that you, you can look at it in a broad perspective and join up what you do in different areas. If, if different businesses act individually, then how do you get the same effect? Well, you need to scale for impact to get the effect, and that's obviously where the Millennium Development Goals come in, because they provide a wonderful framework also for business, like it does for government, to uh, forge these partnerships. So let me build on what Bill was saying. There's an enormous progress. We still have 500 days. I always remind people my watch isn't giving yeah. the time. It's actually counting the days that we still have to finish the other Millennium Development Goals that we're still working on. So let's do that. The business community has been extremely helpful to say we want clear targets. We want these targets to be time-bound. We want to be held accountable like we hold other people accountable. This whole transparency is a very important part of the uh, uh, goals that are coming up. We also put a special section in on partnership. There are two different forms of partnership. One of them is a global partnership for the overall development, which is a partnership based on morality, the role that we have to speak for the people that can speak for themselves, which is the ones that go to bed hungry. And the second partnership is concrete partnership on, product, on uh, projects where we all need to work together. I think we've all come to the conclusion, including business, that these issues we're trying to solve here are incredibly complex and incredibly difficult to solve alone for governments, for business, etc. This is a unique opportunity that we have to work in this partnership. And for business, it has given an enormous education, but also an enormous opportunity. We've learned that it's not just about food security, but it's also about nutrition. And if it's also about nutrition, it's also about wash and hygiene. We've learned about the role of smallhold farmers. We know how important it is to invest in women. You have no idea what these Millennium Development discussions do to educate business, to make their business, model, uh, their business models more effective, but also to see the business opportunities much broader on how they can contribute. I'm sure that the, the future Unilever business model, in fact, we're working on this already, is much stronger because I've spent one and a half years being exposed to a lot of other things. Bigger partnerships are emerging, multi-party, not only business, again, with governments, with NGOs, we probably would have never talked with. If we sit in the room together, you all of a sudden get a breakthrough. There are two final comments. One of them is what the Secretary General was saying before. Felipe Calderon is working now, the former president of Mexico, on the climate economy. We need to break this paradigm that we can't have one and the other. We need to break this paradigm that we cannot alleviate poverty and solve climate change. The climate change economy is going to show that this is an opportunity for positive growth, for job creation, whilst doing it the right way. So the business community here feed in your experiences and your examples. The second thing is, this is not a government process. It really bothers me that we say these governments are negotiating something for the world. This is a citizen's process. Mm -hmm. And we need, and business also is there to serve the citizens. So we need to enroll the broadest group of people. The response we got from young people in, in the process leading up to this, uh, the task force report makes me convinced that we need to fight on. We have discussed at uh, the World Economic Forum here a project which is called Future Awesome, where all the companies and others put all their connections together, get the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Googles, mm -hmm. and others to, together as well. We can connect a billion, a yeah. billion and a half um, people, I, I just, create this movement because it's for everybody out there. And you, you mentioned the complexity of the debate, and, and I'll go, I suppose the difficulty with climate is been that you know the, the facts are so alarming and many people might feel you know resigned to the idea of a warmer world and think there's not much that can be done about it the business imperative is an interesting one and I wonder how much difference you think it is going to make to the to the mood on climate well Paul Pullman and the company he leads Unilever uh, are among the finest examples anywhere in the world of business uh, doing well and doing good simultaneously by having a higher ambition to adopt the highest values, and consumer-facing businesses in particular are rewarded for this as they should be, but it helps them with retention and recruitment and with uh, every aspect uh, of the business. It unlocks a higher fraction of 
the human potential among those who work in these businesses. And businesses are beginning to show uh, great leadership on the climate issue and, and, and on the development challenges that we have. But still many do not. Uh, and even with business leadership, we will need governmental actions. We need to put a price on carbon. We need to put a price on carbon in markets and we need to put a price on denial in politics. And we need to recognize as we uh, head toward the Secretary General's meeting in September that there is still a gap between the kinds of measures that are being discussed and the dramatic advances that are necessary in order to safeguard the future of human civilization. Elsewhere in Switzerland, thank you to the Swiss people, there are these negotiations involving the future of Syria. That is a drought-prone region, and the scientists tell us that the droughts are made deeper and more harmful. From 2006 to 2010, a million people from rural areas of Syria were driven by the worst drought they've had into the cities, joining a million refugees from Iraq, by the way, and the sectarian tensions uh, just bubbled out of control as a result. In 2010, Russia had the worst drought in its history and the worst fires. They withdrew their grain from the markets, as did Ukraine and Kazakhstan, because of the same uh, uh, climate-related weather event. And food prices reached the highest level in all of history. It was a food vendor in Tunisia uh, who yeah. set himself on fire, many other factors. But there were food riots in many countries. We have to recognize that the vulnerability of the food system to droughts, fires, the disruption of the precipitation cycles, um, more threats from pests, and heat stress itself. Uh, this represents a huge challenge. And so as we find ways to get a higher ambition to put a price on carbon, uh, we have to also recognize that yes, it's a citizen problem. Governments will have to take action. Uh, and Mr. Secretary General, I hope that everyone here and with the sa within the sound of our voices will be a part of the conversation uh, and the cultural shift th uh, on climate uh, and on the larger challenge of securing the human future so as to embolden the governments that you need support from as you tackle this challenge. Um, Bill Gates, um, a final word from you about the next stage maybe of, of the foundation's work. Are you going to broaden what you do so that you, know, you, you, are, uh, you are working across some of what have been seen as divides in the development world? Well, in terms of mitigation, the things that you do for poor farmers without climate change are exactly the same things you do for poor farmers with climate change. You give them drought resistant seeds, you give them higher productivity, and that's actually a growing uh, part of our activity and a lot of great science that will let us uh, move forward on that. In terms of uh, health, as we've said, that uh, is the leading thing that gets these very high population growth rates down. And that's occurring in exactly the place the world can least afford it. It's in Yemen, it's in Pakistan, it's in uh, parts of Africa that have the least ability to support people. So the focus of our foundation for my lifetime will be these health and agricultural issues. Uh, you've got to specialize. Uh, we think that we can go from a, a world where six million uh, children a year are dying uh, get that down uh, to under two million. And so we're gonna stay focused on those things uh, until we, we achieve uh, health equity, where if you're born in a poor country, you're no more likely to die uh, than any other child on the planet. Okay, well, these are, these are big issues and this is a, a crucial moment to discuss them as the UN uh, moves uh, into really focusing on this in, in the months and in the 18 months or so ahead. And please join me in thanking all the panelists and thank you in the audience. Thank you.